Why is it necessary to have an orgasm? Why would selection have favored having an orgasm sometimes and not others? Why does it happen so infrequently? Measured several variables related to the masculinity and dominance of their partner, including taking photos of the guys and measuring objectively how male typical the face was, how masculine it was, or how feminine it was. Having those faces rated by unfamiliar people, we found that those things correlated pretty well and that women whose partners were more masculine, that those women took less time to have an orgasm during sex and more likely to have an orgasm. David, I want, I want to talk about the female orgasm. I feel like that's what everybody's come to hear us talk about. Female orgasm, a massive mystery. You've done some really, really interesting work on it. Why does the female orgasm exist? What's the, what's the function of it? That's a great question. Um, and I would say uh, it's about 10% of the research that we do in my lab, but about 90% of the interviews that I do are about on that topic. And, you know, I guess I should start by saying we don't know. Um, it, but if I had to sort of put my money on uh, a hypothesis, it would be that it functions in mate choice. And, um, and you know, whether in it, that could be in a couple of ways. I mean, it could be that it functions to, um, to choose mates of high genetic quality that will make females offspring healthier and, um, and more fit themselves. Or it could be that it functions to choose, um, long-term investing partners, or it could be some of both. I mean, there's some evidence that, um, that orgasm increases the probability of conception. Um, and so, you know, it makes sense then that, I mean, it could be for either function. It, you know, if, if, mate, if orgasm functions to choose males of high genetic quality, then it would make a special sense, especially sense that um, it would be more likely um, to increase the probability of fertilization. But, um, but, you know, there's also lots of evidence that when women feel closer to their partners and have an emotional connection, that orgasm is more likely as well. So um, I could talk about some of the evidence that, you know, sort of bears on this, but um, I guess, well, maybe I, maybe I'll stop there or maybe I, <laughs> I, I could, I could actually, maybe I'll, I'll say how I got into this, um, which was, I always sort of, you know, appreciated it as an interesting intellectual question. And I understood that um, some evolutionary biologists, uh, you know, thought that it was likely an adaptation and it makes sense that, you know, it, it might be, it's something that uh, is so intimately connected to reproductive behaviors that it seems unlikely to be selectively neutral, you know, to ha have been um, irrelevant to our ancestors' reproductive success. Um, but then, you know, it's something that males are much more likely to have an orgasm when they have sex, and some women have never had an orgasm, and there's not some kind of smoking gun evidence for its function that there are plenty of other evolutionary biologists who say, no, it's, it's not an adaptation. It's just a sort of a happy coincidence and that it's really a byproduct of selection favoring orgasm in males that in, in the same way that males have nipples because of selection on females, female mammals, some female mammals to have nipples, that selection on males to have orgasms has produced a similar trait. So, and, and, uh, and females. And so, you know, I appreciated that question. And then, uh, I guess about 15 years ago or so, I was asked to review a book on the topic. Um, and I thought for, for a journal, for Archives of Sexual Behavior. And I thought, okay, a uh, great chance for me to get into the literature a little bit, read a, read a, a book that reviews the literature and, uh, and also have a publication. I was a postdoc at the time and I, you know, the more publications, the better I thought at the time. And um, I, the book sort of took a strong, uh, it, ostensibly it, it was, um, sort of more neutral, but I came away, you, you, it's, anyone reading the book comes away thinking that the author really supports the byproduct hypothesis, that orgasm is not functional in human females. And I came away from the book feeling that the author was more likely to be wrong um, than when I started the book, you know, that it just seemed to me that, you know, you could pick away at any bit of evidence and say, well, it's an imperfect study, this doesn't show for sure. But every bit seems to support the hypothesis that that women's orgasm functions in choosing mates um, and that it's unlikely to be simply a byproduct that, you know, it should be reduced, for example, but byproducts like men are bigger, but their nipples are smaller because when, when selection doesn't favor a trait um, in 
it favors it in one sex and not in the other, then it tends to be vestigial or rudimentary in the sex where it's not an adaptation. And if you think about the sort of phenomenology of female orgasm, if anything, it's bigger than it is in males, less frequent. But that could be, it makes complete sense if it's um, functions in choosiness. I had Carol Hooven on the show a little while ago, and she was explaining about what happens when people take testosterone and transition from female to male, and then some people detransition and go back. And she spoke about sexual desire and sex drive and stuff like that. But she also right. spoke, about, uh, spoke about subjective orgasm quality and spoke oh, about the difference between uh, natal women, as she calls them, and the sort of full body, uh, much longer lasting, sort sort of warm feeling, then taking testosterone, transitioning to being a male or a man at least, not transitioning to being a male, uh, transitioning to being a man, and then having a more sort of localized, higher peak, less duration, and mm -hmm. then detransitioning back and going, oh my god, I've seen both sides of the the fence here. That is fascinating, and I would love to talk to those people. I've, you know, I've sort of. Um also have some anecdotal evidence from just, you know, sort of, uh, yeah, talking to people. And, and one account was that um, this was also a, this is secondhand, I got this, that, um, so friend of a friend um, transitioned, um, you know, uh, female to male and started taking testosterone and said, before I started taking testosterone, I could masturbate. After I started taking it, I had to. <laughs> it was just like a necessity. Um, so anyway, yeah, that's interesting. Um, thinking about the sort of you know physiology underlying some some sex differences, um, and I'm sure that some of some of it is sort of some of the differences in sexual desire response and so on are sort of direct effects of sex hormones acting on on the brain, including patterns of gene expression in the brain, and then some of it, of course, is also. Uh, the effects of those sex hormones on anatomy, right? I mean, uh, you know, penises and clitorises are, are aroused in different ways. And, you know, so, yeah. Okay. So previously, I think the when I first started getting into evolutionary psychology, the first explanation I had beyond it just being a byproduct or some vestige of it being a, a the orgasm being a byproduct of the man was for bonding was the fact that there's this flood of hormones that gets released after that. Uh, how how much uh, contribution do you think there is with regards to the oxytocin and the feel good and the closeness and stuff that females have after sex? Yeah, I, I go ahead. After <laughs> orgasm, after sex. Right, right. Yeah, so that is an interesting, I mean, we really don't know a whole lot about um, this hormone that's released uh, in the brain from sexual arousal and also especially after orgasm. But oxytocin does in in experimental you know laboratory mammals it does have an effect on sort of bonding pair bonding behaviors in um in socially monogamous rodents and and there's some evidence in people too although it's just harder to do a, a well-designed experiment in people um but um but i i think that it it must have some kind of an effect like that to make uh women feel more emotionally close to their partner and then also there have been a couple of studies that have um, treated women with oxytocin and looked at um, what happens to a, a sperm-like fluid, a semen-like fluid. It was the same viscosity as semen and radio-labeled. And um, so some women were happy to participate in a study like this, but it was treating women with oxytocin and looking at what happens to this, um, this semen-like fluid after oxytocin treatment. And the answer was, that um, it's always brought into the um, it, it's always brought into the uterus, but the question is, does it go up into a fallopian tube? Because that's where fertilization takes place, right? When the egg is released from one side, from one o ovary, then there are generally sperm waiting there. Uh, if if fertilization is going to happen, then there'll be sperm waiting there, um, sort of embedded with their little heads embedded in the epithelium there. And then, and then they can, you know, one, one of them can fertilize the egg. So you have to get sperm there and sperm swim, but a little bit, you know, it's just like they have a little, they're tiny and they can't get very far on the, their own. The way that they're, they move up toward the egg is through peristaltic muscular contractions of the female reproductive tract. It's the female tract that's moving them um, upward. And these, uh, the, this fluid was moved toward the 
in, into an oviduct. And the closer that the women in the study got to ovulation, the bigger their um, follicle was, that, so closer to bursting and releasing an egg, the more transport you had just into the oviduct where an egg was going to be released. And this was just after oxytocin treatment. So that's kind of, to me, that's kind of strong evidence that um, if you if you do an experiment and you treat some women with the hormone that's released, especially after orgasm, it, and its effect is to move sperm or a sperm-like fluid toward and up the oviduct where an egg is going to be released. And the closer you are to ovulation, the more fertile, the more of that transport just goes up into that oviduct. I mean, that suggests that orgasm also has that function because why else would oxytocin play this role? You know, this this hormone that's released um, during sexual arousal, but especially after orgasm. Dude, the the price that people pay for science, those women right. <laughs> that were happy to yeah. have a semen-like substance put inside of them, then be treated with oxytocin, right. then have it tracked to see right. whether the cilia waving it along and getting right. it into the right fallopian tube. Dear God. Um, but how do we not know, if that's the case, how do we not know that female orgasm is not just a mediator between the act of sex and the release of oxytocin? Um how do we know it's not a mediator? It's, I it's mean, that that's not just the only function for it. All it is is just like a gatekeeper that says oxytocin is what's to go. It's got nothing really to do with anything else. It, all it is is just we're releasing oxytocin. That's going to improve fertility. Oh, it could be. But then the question is, um, I mean, at a sort of, I think that's the hypothesis is that it, it plays that role. But then the question is, um, why why do... Why is it necessary um, to have an orgasm? And why does it happen sometimes? You know, like in other words, why would selection have favored having an orgasm sometimes and not others? Why why does it happen so infrequently? Um, you know, if if selection just said, look, natural selection that is said, look, um, it's you know what's favored by selection is having more offspring, then you would expect have or, an orgasm every time with sex because that increases your chances of, of fertilization that increases the number of offspring. But if it was more like, well, but having get, being pregnant all the time is not a good, a good idea. If the mates are of differing quality, then, you know, select ones that are more investing, more caring, more loving, more have better genes for your offspring, whatever, then it makes sense to have this mechanism that increases the odds of fertilization be dependent upon those characteristics, you know, be dependent upon the, uh, the quality of a male. And we know for sure that it's not necessary. Like women, plenty of women, ha you know, have kids and have never had an orgasm in their life. Um, so I think if anything, it's just um, increases the odds. And given that it's something that doesn't happen all the time, and there's some, also some, some evidence that measures of male mate quality increase, you know, affect the probability of women having an orgasm. Um, it seems like it seems like it has that function to me, but um, I want more evidence. You know, I, I can imagine a, a study where I, so I gave you circumstantial evidence that orgasm increases the odds of conception, but what would be really great is to do a study, like we have some idea of the fertile window um, because people have participated in studies where they recorded when they had sex with their partner and then um, later found out when they, when they got pregnant. And then you can sort of model that and say, okay, so um, these are the days that are fertile, the day of ovulation and it looks like the five days before. If women had sex during those days, they had a non-zero chance of, of conception. So you can sort of say these are the probabilities of conceptions on different days of the cycle. You could do a study like that, um, but also have participants record whether they had an orgasm with their partner and then see how that influences the sort of daily conception risk. Um, and that that would be strong evidence that orgasm increases the odds of, of conception. But that kind of research, I, I would love to do it someday. I've just got so many, you know, I, whatever irons in the fire. I, I, I haven't sort of taken steps. So what I do is when I, whenever I talk to somebody about this, I say, this would be a good study. Somebody should do it. I don't know if I'm going to do it. but um, So you, what you would be able to do there is split test uh, sex from orgasm and non-orgasm to see just how much of a uh, fertility 
tool boost or something. yeah it is yeah. it is to do that okay so talk to me about the relationship between dominant men and orgasm success well uh so we published one study uh about 10 years ago where we um had women in their uh, heterosexual women and their male partners um participated as couples and they but they answered all the questions separately about you know sexual response and that sort of thing um then we made sure that you know, they were they understood when they were going in that they were not going to find out the answers that their that their partner provided. Um, and we found that women whose partners who rated their partner, we sort of measured several variables related to the masculinity and dominance of their partner, including taking facial uh, photos of the guys and measuring objectively how male typical the face was, how masculine it was or how feminine it was, having those faces rated by um, unfamiliar people having women rate their partners on sort of, you know, dominance and masculinity. And we found that those things correlated pretty well and that women whose partners were more masculine, that those women um, uh, had an earlier orgasm or more you know, sort of it took less time to, to have an orgasm during sex and, um, and more likely to have an orgasm. And so we suggest, you know, we thought, well, there's a lot of literature that suggests that traits that require high levels of, sex hormones to produce, um, that those are indicators of underlying genetic quality. And so our prediction is, well, if female orgasm functions in part to recruit good genes for your offspring, then women should more easily orgasm and, and have earlier, you know, earlier timed orgasms with, um, with putative good genes males, in this case, sort of more masculine and dominant. And that's what we found. Um, you know, I'm, I'm happy with the study, but it's, I'd like more data. You know, it, one study doesn't prove anything. But. Would it not be possible for men to overshoot dominance? I've been, I've had a bunch of conversations about ancestral leadership and stuff like that, yeah. and it seems yeah, yeah, yeah. like the the tyrant dominant male actually ends up being killed pretty quickly because people don't like that in a, a small tribe of 150 people. So, did you find dominance topping out at all? Is there a way to overshoot on dominance? That is a great question, and um, I think I don't recall looking at it. Although our sample size, you know, the so when you're starting to look at both linear and curvilinear effects, then um, you'd like uh, sort of the more effects you look at, the bigger sample you'd like. And I and I I just now I'm wondering if we still have those data. I don't think we looked at that, but that's a great possibility. And I think you're absolutely right about that. And in fact, um, I think that that's something that characterizes other primates too, but might be especially true in, in humans that um, we've sort of, uh, so in our ancestors, our males probably competed via contest competition by, you know, threats of aggression and actual physical aggression and one mating opportunities that way. But we engage in a lot less, a lot less frequent um, fighting than say our closest living relatives, chimpanzees. I mean, human males, are more likely, whether they're boys or men, more likely to fight and get, you know, get engaged in some kind of physical altercations um, than females. But it's about 1% as frequent as it is in chimpanzees. And I think a lot of that has to do with exactly what you said, that um, maybe around 2 million years ago, 1.5 million years ago, and around Homo erectus, that we um, got really good at killing including each other and predators. We, we became sort of hyper predators around that time, probably. Um, there's evidence of sort of uh, increased carnivory, increased brain size, changes in, sh in shoulder uh, structure that would suggest throwing. Um, and that once we became very deadly, um, then it became important not to get out of hand with your uh, you know, because you can easily escalate a, a yeah, small right. disagreement yeah. to one that becomes lethal yeah despots can be can be killed by anybody um and so it's more important you know and, and then of course there's also coalitional aggression in, in humans and in chimpanzees but it you know warfare is something that it seems to have happened throughout human evolution and that requires some sort of um you know uh group cooperation and, and competition against other groups as well. So anyway, I, I, I'm sure that you're right about that, that, um, that, you know, there's a lot of emphasis in human groups on prestige, which is freely conferred social status that you, you get social status by conferring benefits to the group. Um, 
and um, and you know you have to be careful with the dominance with coerced um, status because we're 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 deadly. Dude, I tell you what would be an awesome study to be able to do to look at the uh, local ecology of the situation that the particular tribe is in. If the tribe was in a time of more stress, i.e. potentially there are um, external tribes that are going to war with them, there is more male aggression between tribes, that is a time, it seems like, anthropologically, where it is useful for a more dominant leader rather than a prestigious leader. People want the person that's going to just get shit done, the more psychopathic traits, maybe a little bit better. I wonder if that would be reflected in female orgasm rate and mate choice. Great idea. Yeah. <laughs> it's a it's a completely that, simple, yeah, yeah. superbly well, simple study to do, obviously. Um, uh, yeah, I can imagine doing it. A big, It would be huge, right? C- big cross-cultural study, um, hopefully getting some data from sort of non-Western societies as well. How cool would that be to work out whether female mate choice uh, wane, sort of uh, swings between prestige and dominance uh, preference based on what's going on situationally? I think you could do a study like that, um, both with sort of stated preferences. You know, you could ask people what they're after, but also, um, yeah, looking at at orgasm as a potential mate choice mechanism as well. I think mm. that would be, yeah, that'd be a pretty cool study. Um, I, I've, you know, we're in my lab. We've recently done some cross cultural work, and it is, if you want to get a good representative, you know, set of societies, it's a ton of work, but it, it I think it's well worth it. I, I think mostly what people are interested in human evolution want to know is sort of uh, about humans broadly, not American undergraduates or British undergraduates or something. And so it's nice to sort of look at how some of these mating, mate choice, mate competition patterns are similar across societies, how some sex differences are similar, how they how they change as well. What are, what are some of the socioecological variables that that predict those differences and can you can you predict those things based on you know evolutionary theory like you're doing now so yeah i love it Good uh, idea. <laughs> okay so you, you mentioned there about contest competition and this was the first time that i ever got introduced to the idea of it was reading your work and when we think about sexual selection a lot of the time we consider sort of the ornaments of sexual selection right sort of the peacock's tail type thing but when it comes to humans there are a bunch of and also other animals as well but when it comes to humans it seems like there are a huge number of other types of competition that are going on so what what do you think have been the primary mechanisms of sexual selection when it comes to humans okay um so right so when people who study sexual selection which is the kind of natural selection that favors traits that win mates um when they think about that they they sort of tend to categorize into different modes or mechanisms, right? Ways that you could win mates. So there's contest competition, which favors, uh, you know, size, strength, aggression, weapons. It's it's the use of force or threat of force to, to win mating opportunities. There's mate choice, which favors, you know, uh, ornaments and sexual displays. But there's sperm competition. Sometimes uh, two males mate with the same fertile female. And then the male who produces more sperm or more viable sperm or more motile sperm is more likely to fertilize. Um, and sexual coercion is another one that happens across many animal species that, you know, males can use force not just against each other, but also against potential mates to win mating opportunities. Mm-hmm. And if I had to sort of rank um, mechanisms of sexual selection operating on human males over recent evolutionary history, let's say in the past, you know, a couple hundred thousand years, I'd say probably contest competition, then mate choice, and then... Uh, I'm not sure between coercion and, and sperm competition, but I, but I, between those first two, um, contest competition and mate choice, um, when I when I started studying this stuff in grad school, the literature, everything I was re- reading, pretty much talked about how male traits, like if we if we talked about say beards or deep voices or f- f- facial masculine or anything like that, it would have sort of talked about that trait as if it were a sexual ornament for attracting females. And I started doing research on the voice. Um, I can remember sitting on a bus in Pittsburgh thinking about what am I going to do for my for my dissertation. I wanted to have one of at least two characteristics. Either it has some obvious sort of utility in helping humanity, like it has some medical relevance or something like that, or and or 
it opens up sort of a new area of research that ha hasn't kind of been done yet. And it just, I think I was, I remember sort of having that debate with myself about, you know, what, what should my dissertation be and, and what characteristics should it have? And I thought back to um, doing some holiday shopping at a mall in Pittsburgh and hearing two guys behind me who seemed to be competing to talk in a, in a lower voice pitch with one another. Um, you know, like this, and it's like, and I was like, what is going on? And I turned around and noticed, oh, there was a cute young woman near near them, and they were probably, you know, trying to show off. I'm like, ah, yeah. And so then I'm sitting on the bus thinking about this, and I thought, you know, voice has to be a sexually selected trait, right? I mean, it's like the deep voices of human males um, were, uh, you know, a little bit bigger than females, but our voice, our voices are way lower than you'd predict. Like human males are about seven or eight percent taller so their vocal folds then should be about seven or eight percent longer but they're 60 percent longer they're like 10 times as as long as you'd predict um based on the size difference and voice pitch you know it's it's half the fundamental frequency it's like an octave lower in males it drops at puberty when when sexually selected traits tend to appear they don't sort of you know antlers don't grow in a deer until they can do some they have some function. They're not competing for mates when they're when they're juveniles, but when they achieve sexual maturity, then they start competing, and then the those costly traits can sort of pay pay for themselves in terms of winning mating opportunities. And so, anyway, I just thought thought about voice, and I thought, yeah, that's got to be sexually selected. And I kind of went into that thinking, based on the literature that I had been reading, it must be about female choice. Like it's got to be a sexual ornament to attract females. And once I started doing research on it, I. I discovered that sure, women prefer um, deep voices a little bit lower than average, but the effect of the same pitch manipulation, when I manipulated sort of the masculinity of a voice, the, the effect of the same manipulation on other men's perceptions of a guy's fighting ability was 15 times as big as the biggest effect that it had on women's preferences. That women kind of cared a bit, but it was just had this huge effect on perceptions of dominance. And I thought, you know, form follows function. Like we can sort of infer ancestral selection pressures by looking at the traits those selection pressures design. And men's voices look like they're much better designed for intimidating other guys than they do at attracting women. And then I started thinking about other traits in the, in the literature on them. And I, you know, every study, sometimes it's kind of swept under the rug in the paper, but um, it, it studies that look at, say, the manipulating the same trait, like facial hair on women's preferences and appearance of dominance, it always has a much bigger positive effect on perception of dominance um, than uh, attraction to women. And so that, that got me thinking about sort of me the d design of men's phenotypes, their, their male phenotypes. And I just uh, kept finding out sort of more studies and more evidence that men's phenotypes really looked like they were designed primarily to either win fights or intimidate uh, their same-sex competitors more than to attract females. We we don't look like sort of peacocks with sexual ornaments as much as we look like a typical mammal and really a typical um, ape. I mean, if you look at all of our closest relatives, you know, males fight each other for mates and they don't really have any clear sexual ornaments, but they have large bodies and aggression and, you know, what long canine teeth. What yeah. are some of the other uh, differences what are some of the other ways that males have developed in a, a, a unique pattern that gets explained by this contest, contest competition? Uh, okay, let me think here. Well, we, there are many traits. And I mean, if we go back to say traits that, we sh that have probably been around for a couple of tens of millions of years that we share with you know, all of the other great apes, um, large body size, um, you know, males, human males have about say 35% more fat-free mass um, and about 60% more muscle mass. Um, and their skeletons indicate a, a, a primate that's about maybe um, 45 to 50% larger than, than females. Um, and uh, aggression, you know, I, I mentioned that there's less frequent um, aggression in human males than there is among, say, chimpanzees, our closest relatives. But it's equally lethal, and so that means that you know if human males fight each other uh, one percent of the time, then it's a hundred times as, as lethal um, uh, among humans. Um, weapons. So the, the typical weapon in, in primates is long canine teeth, 
And, um, and you see that even in socially monogamous like Gibbons and Siamings, they have long canines because it's useful to have a weapon to use against conspecific, same-sex competitors, um, but predators as well. And then um, we lost our long canine teeth. And that, you see that in the first hominins, um, so the first bipedal apes about 7 million years ago, that there's a reduction in canine size. Um, with the evolution of bipedalism, and adaptations of the hand that look like it's good for gripping something. So um, there's a ton of sort of speculation and theorizing about this among anthropologists. But to me, Darwin was probably right that we, you know, evolved uh, bipedalism to to use tools, and um, and that once we did that, we our primary weapons not, became not canine teeth, but you know, rocks and wood or whatever for millions of years until we developed more sophisticated um, weaponry. Well, why, why um, try so, to bite someone? Why, why have to get your head so close if you can just absolutely. put a rock in your hand and smash them over the face with That's it? That's right. Yeah. Like we, we don't have the typical primate weapons, but we have way, way better ones. Yeah. Um, have you read and, uh, and, yeah. Bill von Hippel's work on this? Uh, oh, I, I'm sure that I have. The book um, came but, out about three or four years ago. It's really, really great. He just he, he says the same thing. He suggests yeah. that it seems like a really, really cool insight I got from that was that if you give toddlers a playground and on the playground there's a couple of appropriately sized rocks, right. there is something right. in them that drives them to go over and just pick it up and practice throwing. I was like, right. that's so fucking interesting. Yeah, that is, so there's another, right? Um, now, there are big differences in throwing. And um, so there's about a one and a half standard deviation male advantage in targeting um, that seems to exist even if you control for differences in practice. Um, hang, and on, then hang, on, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. There is yeah. a one and a half standard deviation in accuracy. It, yeah, of, targeting accuracy. Uh, of throwing, even right. if you have the same that's, level of training between men and that, women. So the, the research that's been done on it has tried to control for, for practice. And actually... Um, Melissa Hines, it seems to be driven in part by androgen, by exposure to androgen like testosterone. Um, Melissa Hines showed that uh, women with congenital adrenal hyperplasia, which is a condition where the adrenal glands produce elevated androgens before they're born, um, that they had sort of targeting accuracy that was intermediate between um, unaffected females and, and males. Um, now, who knows exactly whether that's effects of sex hormones acting directly on the developing brain um, and the regions that are involved in targeting or whether it's more involved in like what you like to do and spend your time on um, mm. and whether you like to engage, whether you want to go and pick up a rock. And yeah, throw yeah, yeah. Well, um, I mean, I, the first place that I'm going to here is that uh, proponents for the WNBA are probably slightly unhappy to find out that there is no way that you can level the playing field between the two groups. It would be very difficult to level the playing field because there are certain things that men have a predisposition to be better at than women do. And it seems like throwing is one of those. I, I've never watched women's baseball, but if they use the same size, um, whatever it's called, area, the, the, the area that the throw is actually permitted in. Right, strike zone. Strike yeah. zone. I would yeah. guess that the number of balls that are thrown in the women's MLB will yeah. be greater than the number that are thrown in the men's MLB. Yeah. Well, so the, I don't know if there's there's softball. I mean, women tend to play softball, which is a little bit different. It's underhand pitching. Dude, but I watched really that. Fast. It's fucking vicious. It is so yeah, yeah. fast. And they're closer as well. Apparently, the yeah, pitches, yeah, yeah, yeah. the actual time yeah. that you have on the pitches is way shorter because they throw pretty much not far off as quick. And right. it's super it's short so from the mound to the batter. Yeah, it's so, it's so yeah. vicious. Um. Yeah, and I, I don't know too as much about that, but I but for sure, you know, if if somebody has gone through male puberty, then that gives them certain physical advantages in in physical competition that are difficult to erase. And the and the evidence suggests that um that you can't completely. You know, that even like say removing testosterone, you know, there there's some changes that have already happened that are um but I did want to say about throwing that the, the, there's also an even larger uh, sex difference in throwing velocity, mm. and that is present very early on. So I mentioned the one and a half standard deviation sex difference. There's a one and a half standard deviation in throwing velocity by age three. And by age 12, it's three and a half standard deviations, which is one of the biggest, uh, you know, when you think about 
the sex difference in height is about two standard deviations. Um, and we, it's easy to see that males on average are taller. Of course, yes. there's overlap. And if yes. you look at the WNBA, you can see there are lots of tall women. Um, but but there's a you know a pretty big sex difference in height, but it's nowhere near the, the size of the sex difference in throwing velocity. Here's yeah, the right. thing that no one's speaking about when it comes to the discussion about men and women in each of the sports and the trans leagues and stuff like that. No one is talking about – almost everybody is using velocity, right? Everyone right. is talking about the, the ability to generate power. Right. Nobody is talking about the predisposition to – be more accurate or more precise with particular types of movements. Mm -hmm. That's yeah, really it, interesting. It is. And yeah, I mean, given that some studies have tried to control for both report, like participants own reported practice with throwing activities, but also um, in one study I'm thinking of tried to select an active throwing targeting behaviors that nobody had much experience with, like underhand throwing of a, um, of a ping pong ball or something. I don't remember what it was exactly, but it was something that like, if you're playing typical throwing sports, you wouldn't have practiced this anyway, um, to, to try to control for differences in experience. Um, so that suggests that some of the sex difference isn't due to just, um, you know, what you like to spend your time doing. Um, but either way, those sex differences also are ones that are consistent with an evolutionary history of sort of males targeting each other. Um, but it's also the case, like I mentioned, that, you know, somewhere it seems like for the first, say, four million years or so of hominin evolution, we were typical um, ape um, omnivores where we ate a lot of plants and um, had some meat in our diet. Chimps hunt, um, you know, red colobus monkeys. Sometimes they eat meat, too. They're just not not as much. They're mostly frugivores. They eat fruit, you know. And our early hominin bipedal small brained like chimp sized brained ancestors for the first several million years probably were not eating a ton of meat and then maybe became better scavengers uh three and a half million years ago by but by the evolution of our own genus homo around two million years to one and a half million years ago we got really good at hunting and we know that and so it's not clear how much of the sex difference in throwing velocity and, and targeting has to do with male-male competition and targeting each other versus targeting prey. Um, because we also know when you look at modern hunter-gatherers that there's a big sex difference in subsistence strategy, that males hunt more and females forage more. And that it, like if, one, if only one sex hunts in this group, it's males. If one sex hunts bigger game, it's males. I mean, it's just, I'm just describing something. I'm not saying how it should be. Yeah, but it but makes a, sense. There's a big difference that it probably was ancestral as well. Yeah, Exactly. It makes complete sense about why the men would have this uh, overpowered throwing ability if it was mostly them that were having to go out and throw stuff at other right. animals. Yeah, so, right. uh, th I mean, this is the interesting thing about the the male-male aggression and how much that's driven sexual dimorphism and the, the traits that we see in men and how they're different in women. How do you separate out the traits that men have that have been developed to be effective at whatever dominance and aggression toward other men rather than just straight up survival or uh, ornaments or like wilderness, uh, yeah, wilderness survival? Yeah. Um, you know, you can't in many cases. And the, the reality is that for any trait of any organism, there are often many selection pressures operating on it simultaneously. And sometimes those pressures work in opposition, like um, for stature, for height in human males. Um, probably there's sexual selection favoring a taller height than, a, than is the average. And there's ecological selection or survival selection favoring a shorter height, you know, because it's costlier to produce this. Uh, you have to have more resources to produce and maintain that kind of phenotype. And so those are, you know, sort of body size is one of those traits that, that probably sort of ordinary natural selection or ecological selection and sexual selection are working in opposition. Um, but any trait has, um, you know, sort of multiple selection pressures operating at the same time. And so that's true of sort of typical masculine characteristics in human males that there's almost certainly been female mate choice, male contests and ecological selection at a minimum operating on it. And so it can be really hard to say how much of trait X is because of male contest. But if you, you know, do careful experiments and you look across societies and see similar patterns and say, wow, um, you know, this trait looks like it functions much more efficiently at function X than it does Y or Z, then that 
that suggests that you know that's been a stronger selection pressure and and when you look at human male traits it's just that they look like they function better and the experiments that have been done and and also sort of correlations with in sort of more um uh naturalistic type studies correlations with outcomes as well it just looks like male traits function better um in, for contest competition and and you know many of these things existed way before there was say specialized hunting in humans like you know our all of our closest living relatives have male male competition and fighting and stuff so large body size muscularity aggression those things have existed probably for tens of millions of years in our lineage way before there was anything like you know specialized hunting so yeah i heard that the brow ridge the increased brow ridge that men have would maybe be one of these particular traits that as soon as you have hands, especially amongst men, bigger hands that can be balled up into fists that you can punch each other in the face with. It is adaptive for you to have basically an extra little bit of armor that runs right. that runs yeah. a, that runs across here. Is that something you've come across? Yeah, um, it, it is, and I I know that I suggested it in a paper in 2010, and I don't remember if I was plagiarizing somebody. I hope not. <laughs> and I know that a guy, Dave Carrier. Um, has has published more on it and sort of talked about the evolution of of hominin skulls in that in that light um we so human males have a more prominent um supra occipital torus is the name for this um uh supra orbital torus is that it yeah super orbital torus occipital what am i talking about? um and uh, and and more robust mandible and um it makes sense that those would provide some protection against fractures of the of the face and the and the mandible. Um, they're fairly gracile. They're much less robust than they than were on our ancestors, you know, um, a million, two million years ago. Um, but but still, the sex difference. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense to me that uh, a, a slightly larger brow ridge could protect eyes from punches or hit, hits from other things too. You know, a rock or a club or something like that. Um, and same thing with a jaw. I mean, that's like, you know, young males get way more jaw fractures than anybody else. And it's, you, it's the most commonly report other than car accidents, which are evolutionarily novel, um, it, across studies, the most common cause is, um, you know, uh, hit with a blunt op fist or blunt object, you know? So that's how they get these, despite having a thicker mandible. So it makes sense that in our ancestors, if you broke your jaw, you couldn't have your jaw wired shut and feed through a tube that would just possibly be catastrophic right i mean life life ending um and so it makes sense that selection would favor a bit more robust um skulls that said uh there has been a sort of reduction in overall skull robusticity in the over the past few million years and i wonder how much of that has to do with um changes in our weaponry going more toward um cutting and puncturing um, yeah, then, a big thick then, brow yeah, makes very yeah. little difference if you've like it would have made a lot a of knife. sense to yeah to hominins you know f five six million years ago when they were only bashing, <laughs> um, and there and there was huge sexual dimorphism in the shape of the skull as well back then. So when it comes to talking about this male male aggression that we're discussing here. How does that help men get mates? Surely there's still the female that is an element of this. I understand how it helps you win a fight, but it, it's not necessarily apparent how it would make you better at getting a mate. Yeah, that's something that I've, I've wondered about a lot because, you know, for one thing, we're not a species like elephant seals where um, males fight for a piece of real estate on a breeding beach. They exclude all of their males and then... Um, the the beach master the dominant male has exclusive sexual access to um all the females in the spot of real estate that he's been able to to defend we're not like that we live in multi-male multi-female groups and um and there's almost certainly been lots of scope for mate choice and so you know how does dominance competition translate and into mating opportunities and there are a few ways one of them is coalitional aggression which is something so i, I mentioned that like in small scale societies you, you probably you know people who study this would still call it warfare um it, this happens in in our closest living relative chimpanzees as well that groups of males will attack other groups or especially single individuals from other groups um 
and um, and uh, take females from those groups. And that's something that seems to, you know, in the historical records, and there's even archaeological evidence um, that that's something that has happened in human groups over time, that sort of males attacking other groups, killing some enemies and, and abducting um, females. Um, so that's one way that male-male aggression could result in mating opportunities. Um, there's within groups um, fights over, you know, when two males are after the same female. Um, you know, Frank Marlowe was an anthropologist who studied the Hadza. They're one of the last hunter-gatherer groups in, in the world. Um, and um, only about a thousand of them left. And he talked about um, how in the Hadza, it's free mate choice. Unless two guys are interested in the same woman and then one might kill the other one with an arrow, which kind of constrains the scope for, for mate choice. Um, but that's something that happens. It, you know, male aggression often occurs when two when male aggression happens, it often occurs when two guys are interested in the same female. Um, and also defensive mates um, is another way. Um, and N Napoleon Shagnon was an anthropologist who studied the, the Yanomamo, who are horticulturists from um, South America. And he talked about how when one male suspects another one of trysting with his wife, then he can ch sort of challenge him to a fight. Um, and that sometimes results in death as well. But they're sort of, you know, a way of fighting translating into retaining a mate but then really i think the threat of all these things you know that like like i mentioned that human males are not unabatedly at one another's throats fighting all the time but there's the sort of potential for it and that the, the threats of those things um can deter rivals from trying to win the same mate that a male is going to try to get or to uh, to you know cheat with another guy's wife or, or mate or something like that so um but then also it's the case that um, across species when males compete through contest competition, females often evolve preferences for dominant males or males of high status and the traits that win status. Because, when you think about it, it's for females, if they just let males duke it out, males are imposing strong selection on one another to see who's the fittest or whatever. And so females can sort of then just sit back and say, oh, well, that guy must be successful. So um, that happens in, in many species, and it, it could be the case, too, that, you know, uh, social status is highly attractive, and you could sort of let males decide who's, who's high status among themselves and then pick that, you know, the winners. I had a conversation with Rob Henderson uh, last week, and he taught me about this study that had been done where uh, men and women reported uh, based on the faces of the people that they saw, the relative attractiveness and dominance. Uh, so the men judged the dominance and the women judged the attractiveness. And they found that over the next year, all of the men whose photos they used then self-reported the number of sexual partners that they'd had. And the men that were judging the dominance were more accurate at rank ordering the faces based on how many sexual partners they would have. Dominance was a better predictor of sexual partners than attractiveness from women. So it seems like the men were better able to predict the number of sexual partners that the men would have than the women were, despite the fact that women are the market for what these men were going for. That is an awesome study. And at first I wanted, I wanted to know, is this a study that he did? Because it also, no. it sounds like one that, okay, I think it's one that I did. <laughs> it very well might be your study. I think, I think you're describing a paper that we published in evolution and human behavior a few years ago where we had, um, we wanted to study this phenomenon and to try to understand um, whether um, success in male-male competition was a better predictor of mating success than success under female choice. And so we said, look, um, what this would have looked like over most of human evolution was probably not a whole bunch of strangers rating strangers' faces and voices and whatever. It'd be like people mostly knowing each other. And um, so why don't we get a bunch of guys who know each other to assess the prestige and dominance and so on of guys that they know and then have women who know the guys based on everything their sense of humor their intelligence how nice they are but also whatever that you know how good looking how dominant what um uh, how attractive they are and then um use that information to predict the guys number of sexual partners and what we found was that, um, oh, and what, what do we, how do we do this? 
um, we recruited um, two of the largest um, social fraternities um, at, at Penn State and then the, their socially affiliated sororities um, to participate in the study. And, and we found that um, guys were able to, that their, their sort of average rankings of guys' dominance um, predicted guys' number of sex partners. Um, and when we put those in a statistical model with how attractive the women who knew the guys said the guys were, that, that though attractiveness ratings didn't explain any additional variation in number of sex partners. You're beyond, kidding me. Beyond dominance. And, you know, it's funny, I just lectured on that um, and I took it out of my lecture um, this year because I'm behind on things and I thought, oh, it's, you know, it's one study in the in American undergrads and, you know, I can cut it out. Um, but I often, you know, when I do in past semesters, when I talk about that particular study, I sort of present it to the classes like, uh, how does this happen? Because doesn't it feel like what's really determining uh, a guy's sort of mating success is whether women find him attractive? I mean, doesn't that really have, don't, don't you have that strong feeling in this society that's the prim primary determinant? And I'm not sure exactly, but it, it could be things like, you know, in um, uh, bars and parties and wherever the sort of mating relationships are formed, that dominant males um, are not challenged if they're trying to attract a female. Subordinate males or guys, you know, guys who are clearly wimpier would never inter impose themselves and, and, and you know, inject themselves into that conversation and say, "Oh, no, no, no talk to me." Um, whereas a dominant male would have no compunction about, you know, um, getting in the middle of the, this wimpy guy is talking to this really good-looking woman and have no problem just you know, yeah, out of the way. And and so I, I don't know, that's one possibility, but um, I'd love to study sort of the the actual causal connection there. Yeah. I would also be very interested to find out how online dating uh, in the modern world is changing this. Right. You know, uh, how easy is it to show dominance or prestige really uh, over a Tinder profile or an Instagram account? Um, right. You know, what What cues is a high follow account and a blue tick? What do they give off? Does that show prestige? Does it show dominance? Is there a way that you could construct a bunch of fake Instagram accounts and the kind of photos that were being taken and the kind of language that was being used and the follow account? Uh, is, is there a way that you would be able to right. work that out? Because, you know, the environment now of whatever you're talking about here, like almost mate guarding in a way or a potential mate guarding uh, when you're chatting somebody up in a party that's that doesn't work anymore anybody can message anybody on tinder that's right yeah and and my my guess is if you did a study like that i mean just based on the the sort of research that's already been done i just don't think that very dominant appearing guys are going to be attractive i mean i i just think that you know women tend to prefer sort of somewhere close to the male average for traits you know like a little taller than average but not too tall a little more muscular than average but not too muscular the faces that manipulate facial masculinity. Some find that, that on average women preferred a little bit to the feminine side of male average, some a little bit more masculine, but surround the average. Same with voice pitch. It's like too low is kind of weird sounding, but um, but so a little lower than average probably. Um, but I, I, I really think that, yeah, if you made a guy seem very dominant, he would seem, I don't know, scary, antisocial, something. Well, th and, you know, yeah. <laughs> think about it this way. Think about the fact that your study was able to look at what women said that they wanted. That was what that, that was the stated preference, right? Of this person yeah, how, is the yeah, most. We had them rate on sort of how attractive a guy would be for a long term committed relationship, um, and also for just sex. And but if if um, the men, if the dominance element is somehow influenced by the presence of other men, and then you take those men out of the equation in online dating, right? What are you left with? Well, I wonder whether the uh, subjective ratings of attractiveness from women are now less encumbered somehow, whether or not they're able to uh, take less heed of other men's cues of this guy is dominant or not dominant. I think you're right. I think that's, I think that's what you would see. And so my suspicion is that these, that the sort of dominant traits and dominant behavior um, is functional in a setting where there are male competitors and that, you know, and for sure, um, when women have been asked to rate behavior, like videos of males, they're, 
they might like dominant behavior directed toward other males, but they certainly don't like dominant behavior directed toward females. So, um, yeah. Okay. So what about the difference in male and female mental capabilities? We've spoken just there about the ability to throw. I know that on average, I How much trouble are you trying to get me? I know. (laughs) (laughs) Maybe we've already talked about transports. Um, but I, I read something about, um, men are better at spatial rotation and women are better at remembering directions or something. Yeah. What is yeah, it? Yeah. What are some of the different capabilities? Yeah. So, um, there are, I mean, if you measure overall cognitive function with like an IQ test, there's no difference. Male and males and females have the same average. Now that's by design because IQ tests have similar or composed of similar numbers of the types of questions that women tend to do better at or females tend to do better at and and some and and other ones that males tend to do better at um most cognitive traits don't show a very big sex difference the biggest ones are in spatial cognition and they're they're not huge but about one, one standard deviation sex difference are the biggest ones and um on average males do better at mental rotation so if you're shown the sort of most sort of gold standard test or the most common test is um, to take to be shown a two-dimensional picture of a three-dimensional block figure. It just looks kind of like you know something like that, like one of those um, three by three by three cubes that you have you take apart and have to put together again. Like looks exactly like one of those pieces. Um, and then you're asked which of these, which two of these four th- other images are just is just that thing rotated in space. And um, and if you have a bunch of males and females do this. Um, then you get about uh, 0.6 to 1.0 standard deviation um, male advantage. You get a bigger male advantage when you make the test harder. Um, so if you give them less time to do it, for example, if you give if you give people all the time that they need, then eventually most people can can do it. Um, and then there's a female advantage at object location memory. Um, and one one test that's been that's been uh, published is the memory game, you know, with the cards you flip over, you have a bunch of cards face down and then you flip them over in pairs. And I can remember doing that before I knew about a sex difference like that. I remember doing that with my, with my girlfriend in college and, um, was like sweating bullets as she was destroying me. And I was trying so hard to, to, to concentrate and she would seem to do it effortlessly. And then later, you know, I found out that there's a pretty good size sex difference in um, a female advantage there. I was like, ah, oh, okay, yeah, maybe that's. that's you should have told. You should have told her to come to the pub and play darts so that you could yeah, have even did it. Yeah, right. Um, but anyway, um, so those are the biggest sex differences in spatial cognition, and um, it, also if you there's a test that is that rodents are put into called a Morris water maze. It's a a pool of water filled with some opaque. Um, substance like um, powdered milk so that you can't see and there's a underneath the surface and there's a little platform just underneath the surface so if you put rats in this thing um, but just put them in the maze it's a you know i don't know how big a 10 feet across or something like that and you put them in um, then they would like to not be swimming they'd like to find the platform and climb up on it and stand on it um, and so what you can do is measure and put them in different places in the maze each time and you can see like how how quickly they learn the location of that platform under the water that they can't see or smell. Oh, they get, create a, a abstract map of what it actually yeah, is right. like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, um, and so, you know, there's a sex difference in that um, that males tend to learn it faster. They, they tend to find that platform. And so the latency between when you put them in the pool and when they get onto the platform, um, it, and it isn't to do with swimming ability or motivation or something, you know, that, those things have been tested. Um, uh, but... If you mess with the cues, like the landmarks within the maze, right inside of, you know, sort of marks on the on the border of the maze itself, that messes up females more. And if you mess up, if you if you manipulate extra maze cues, like things that are better for gauging distance and direction, that's that messes up males more. Um, so it, it suggests that they're using sort of different information to navigate. Um, and it's testosterone dependent. If you treat females with early in life with androgen they solve the maze like a male and if you castrate males they solve it like a female and this difference seems to characterize species where males have a bigger home range that they have to travel over a larger area to locate females because you know both sexes are about the same size and they have a range that they they range over the same geographic 
area just to get food. But then if males are also polygynous and trying to mate with multiple females, then they range over a bigger area, then they need sort of different spatial cognitive abilities, including ones that rely less on local landmarks and more on direction and distance. Um, and so anyway, the, se the sex differences that we see probably existed like, you know, ancestrally in mammals a long time ago, but then um, were subsequently shaped by other things like um, possibly male, you know, targeting uh, different foraging strategies, more male hunting, um, ranging over a broader distance to, to track prey and, and hunt versus um, foraging, which is closer to home. Um, what does the... And also targeting, yeah. What, what does the ability to remember cards, uh, like ancestrally, what is that related to? Yeah, the idea is that um, it's related to remembering where food resources that are stationary in the environment are located. And that's kind of a stretch. Um, but there was a cool study by um, Steve Gallen, was the senior author um, at UC Santa Barbara that had recruited participants in a farm farmer's market and, um, and had participants at the end, after they'd spent time in the market, come back and say, okay, point me in the direction of the honey, point me in the direction of the lettuce or whatever. And what they found was um, a female advantage and that um, the uh, higher the caloric returns, the bigger the sex difference, I think it was. Um, so, you know, it's like the, the attempt there was to be more ecological, to say, to show a sex difference in object location memory that was more like foraging, you know, remembering the location of food in the environment. Um, pretty cool study. Um, so that's, that's the reasoning, but it could also just be that if you're ranging over a smaller area, you don't have to travel over such as a, a large area to get animals or to find mates. Um, then you, a different sort of navigational strategy makes more sense, um, using landmarks. I'm going to say something incredibly sexist here. Um, I wonder whether this plays into the women are able to, uh, be more organized and tidy when it comes to a smaller area, like a house. And men are better at when it comes to longer, uh, uh, greater distance organization, like driving. Like the, I know it's a, a total meme, right? To talk about how <laughs> men, yeah, how men are, men are better at being able to remember locations and and to be able to get directions yeah. and stuff like that. But I do wonder whether this would map across. And I have tons of male friends that are absolutely useless behind the wheel. So I, I'm an N, <laughs> I'm an N of one here, right? This and I ask for directions all the time. Yeah, precisely. But. <laughs> Yeah. I do wonder if you would be able to look at um it, it would suggest to me that women would be better able to organize stuff within a smaller location that's what we're talking about right um w does this mean that men more often lose their keys than women do does right. this mean that uh women more often take the wrong route to some place without using satellite navigation than men right. do like that would yeah. be interesting I I don't know about organizing a like a domicile. Um, but I have often in my life attributed that sort of supernatural ability to remember where the keys are. I mean, I've got, you know, a wife, two daughters and a son. And I, actually, my son's pretty good at remember this stuff. But generally, I, you know, the females know where things are. Uh, you know, it might be related to this. And, and, you know, there's another study that show that has participants um, look at an array of common objects, you know, a teddy bear, a telephone, a barbell, you know, whatever, just some common things that you might see. And then um, they're shown that same array of, you know, array of objects again and ask which of these things have been moved or removed. And again, there's a big sex difference favoring females. It seems to be a bigger sex difference. Maybe it only occurs when participants are given a distractor task. In other words, you're told to be doing something else and thinking about something else other than memorizing where all these things are. And then you, and then you, you test them on their, rem on their memory and find that women were remembering where those things were better, even when they were focusing on doing something totally different. Um, and I mean, it, it accords with my experience, um, but yeah, I would never want to use um, my sort of anecdotes as as. And of one, that's a new <laughs> bro science, David. We don't need yeah. to do real yeah. science. We've got bro science. Okay, so you you've done all of this work as well about um, vocal pitch and 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 what yeah. The, yeah. what the what voice pitch uh, can do. Right. Did you do a study that looked at you can tell someone's personality 
from their voice? Yeah, I was a a co-author. I, I can't claim credit for that. I provided some data and helped with um, the writing a bit. Um, but it was really a study out of Lars Penke's lab. At, he's at University of Göttingen in Germany. And um, and one of the results that stuck out to me was that there was a relationship um, between the sort of dominance characteristic of personality and, and voice. But um, yeah, I can't really claim claim credit for that study. Um, but it's cool, and it looks like it's been it's being you know cited pretty highly too. So that's kind of a nice thing. Um, we've definitely looked at this idea in, in our lab. This has been one of the sort of interesting questions driving our recent research is um, why we would pay attention to voice pitch and other characteristics of the voice like vocal timbre, which also shows a, a big sex difference. Uh, males have a, uh, our, our larynx descends a full vertebra lower at puberty in the vocal tract so that our vocal tract sounds longer than it is. I mentioned that males are about seven to eight percent taller, so their vocal tract should be about seven or eight percent longer, but it's, it's 15 percent longer, so twice that. Um, because of this descent of the larynx at puberty. So really we have these exaggerations of size, like males' voices look like they've evolved to make males seem big and scary. And so then we've asked, yeah, but if that's the case, then why do we pay attention? If it's just kind of um, you know, a deceptive signal to say, look at how big I am, why, do we, why, why is selection favored continued attentiveness to this? Why do we continue to defer resources, mates, whatever, to males ah, because we should we should have if, discounted if, if, for the fact it that it's already that smaller it yeah. yeah yeah yeah, yeah if, it, if it doesn't advertise anything so that's been something we've looked at with personality but also things like um you know body size well there's a weak relationship but it's not 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 a strong one but you know larger males have lower pitch and timber Vo testosterone seems to be a, a bit stronger relationship there and especially if you look at cortisol which is a stress hormone so guys who have both um, low cortisol, low stress hormone, and high testosterone have especially deep voices, and that's a kind of a stronger relationship. It's not super strong, but it's you know it's it's there, and it, it's one of the stronger ones. Um, we've looked at like fighting ability, so we looked at MMA fighters to see if their voice pitch predicted their you know success in in fighting and that sort of thing. A little bit of evidence that basically bigger MMA fighters and ones who have more fighting experience had lower pitch voices and. Um, but that's been a really interesting question about sort of um, why do we continue to defer to this trait? You know, does it actually advertise, is there a kernel of truth? Does it advertise something relevant about the sort of competitiveness of, a, of another male? Yeah. That's really, really interesting. I wonder how much of the lowered voice is because they've been punched and choked out a lot. I wonder whether you can... Uh, just if you get, oh, so you get <laughs> if you get someone in a rear naked choke enough that I yeah, don't know yeah. it hypertrophies the the vocal cords somehow. Well, then you, you'd have a relationship in the opposite direction that um, yeah, a, a low, low voice lower voice less success than if case, you've been yeah. choked out too many yeah, times. Yeah, yeah that's a good confounding. Like we have two effects. That, yeah. Um, so and you know it's not it's not really um, when, when we first started doing this, um, I thought. Uh, the guy who proposed the study, I thought that is the coolest study because, you know, in a, we're never going to get data like this in the lab. You can't get a bunch of guys to come in and fight each other. And then you, you measure their voice and see whether, um, you know, voice pitch predicts fighting success. And so I thought that is a really cool way of sort of looking at natural variation and fighting ability. But the reality is that MMA fighters are not typical, right? They're like the best fighters and, and it's, MMA is that I don't I don't know I don't remember all the details about you know you, you can do this kind of fighting but then the ones that we measure were like the professional fighters who so they're like you know the top fraction of a percent or something like that so there's some issue there with like there's really low variation in fighting ability basically well yeah. also I imagine that there are a lot of different ways to win a fight especially when it comes to MMA yeah, yeah, it's right. not simply the most dominant man that goes in there it can be selected right. for all sorts of things conscientiousness uh, industriousness like openness to be able to try new things there's like a, a right. huge number of different ways that you could be and every you see this in fighting right everybody knows oh that's the tactician the person that sits back mm -hmm. a little bit more or that's the guy that's the brawler he's the sort of all-out testosterone guy and what you've right. actually seen if you were to track something like ufc 
over the last 30 years since it started, you've moved more away from the Chuck Liddell, Anthony Rumble Johnson style of just a straight up brawler to now someone who is much more of a, 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 a hitman. Somebody that's incredibly technical with their skill. Okay, well, what is that? What's that selecting for? I mean, there'll be some dominance in there. There'll be a, a good yeah. bit of testosterone in there, but it's it's less about the all-out war, and it's more about this sort of very precise selection of, yeah. of routes to success. That's really interesting. Yeah, when we we approached it, we're just you know sort of coming from the question of if you do rating studies, if you say manipulate voice pitch to make make male voices the same male voices seem lower or higher then the perceptual effect you get is that if you make a voice lower the guy sounds like a better fighter and so then we and if you look at sort of correlational just don't manipulate anything and just have people rate guys voices you find that voice pitch predicts lower voices are, are rated as as better fighters so we sort of approach it from that perspective of regardless of how they become a good fighter whether it's from punching or wrestling or choking out or whatever but just if um, they have a lower voice pitch. Are they a better fighter? In other words, is it you know useful to pay attention to this trait of voice pitch and in, in sort of assessing the formidability of the competitor? And yeah, I mean, we found some evidence in, in MMA fighters, professional MMA fighters. My suspicion is that there would be a stronger relationship if you just took a random sample of guys, especially because there's a, probably a bigger variation in everything that you're interested in, including fighting ability, um, but size and things like that too. So, yeah. You mentioned the story about when you were in the shopping center and the two guys were competing right. for who could have the lower voice pitch. Have you actually done any studies on whether or not men and women modulate their voice pitch based on areas of high mating competition that they're in? Yes. Um, one, only one that I can think of right now, and it was actually part of the dissertation research where, um, I had guys come into the lab. They were told that they were going to um, be in a sort of a dating game thing and they could win a lunch date with a, with a woman. She was a friend who I did a video. She it turned out to be a good actress and she was the potential date and she, she was on a webcam, you know, but it was actually recorded. So everybody saw the same female. She was supposedly in, in the next room and there was another guy in a third room, a competitor. And um, before any of this, I had the guys come in and I recorded, I think it was 100... Uh, how many guys was it? 100 something, 111 maybe, 111 guys. One at a time, um, they came into the lab and I recorded their voice before they knew anything about the circumstances. And then I recorded their voice when they were talking to their competitor. And you might think that as soon as they started talking to their competitor, they you know tried to sound all deep and masculine. But the reality was that some guys lowered their pitch when talking to the competitor and other guys raised their pitch when they were talking to the competitor. And we could predict whether a guy lowered or raised his pitch based on whether he rated himself, the participant rated himself, the speaker rated himself as a better fighter than he rated his competitor, which was the same guy that everybody heard. It was also a friend of mine who was recorded. And so it was the same across all participants. But if guys perceive themselves as less good fighters, than their competitor, they tended to raise their pitch from baseline when they spoke to him. And if they perceive themselves as better uh, fighters, then they lowered their pitch, which makes sense because you'd expect that, you know, if a voice pitch doesn't just sort of influence dominance relationships, but the dominance relationships would also influence how we modulate our voices across contexts. And so, um, and we, you know, we did a, another study um, a few years after that showing that um, the same people when they were asked to speak on a topic that they were an expert on tended to speak in a lower pitch than if they were not an expert on the topic. So, you know, lowering pitch seems like it's a sort of, uh, you're signaling status, authority, dominance, if that's relevant. And probably in male undergraduates, it was very relevant, you know, much more than, you know, older people. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And um, it's, it's a cue yeah. of confidence as well that I know what I'm doing yeah, here. I feel yeah. comfortable in this situation. And the reverse is that it's subservience. It's, I, I, right. yeah. I am no threat. You don't need to worry about me. Listen to that's me it. in my higher pitched voice. I'm absolutely no concern to you. Please don't punch me in the face. That, yeah, that's exactly right. And, it, you know, all, all species where that have this sort of, you know, fighting for whatever resources or mates or whatever, it, it pays to evolve um, signals of deference as well because, um, you know, it, it would not benefit everybody to advertise their maximum dominance to every competitor because that just invites 
you know, a, an escalation of, of competition. And um, if, if you're pretty confident that you're not going to win, then you, you would like to back out and say, no, I'm not signaling, um, you know, aggression here. I, I'm, I'm signaling that, you know, you win and let's not fight, you know. So it makes sense. I mean, it would not, it would not have paid our ancestors to um, evolve signaling threat potential all the time. <laughs> well, especially given what we spoke about at the start, which was men specifically are trying to do everything that they can to signal dominance and aggression without having to actually get into the act of being aggressive. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, and in certain contexts and not uh, not others. You know. Not. Um, I mean, plenty. Of the, people do. People modulate their voice across contexts all the time. Right. I mean, if I'm, you know back when you couldn't tell who was calling you, you're talking and then my wife or, you know, calls and, oh, hi, honey, you know, your voice goes up or to kids, you know, you talk to kids in a, in a non-threatening voice, like, uh, you know, so, um, yeah, anyway, um, I think vo voice has probably been a really, I, I went into studying it um, with no special interest in voice, but just thinking this will be a really useful model trait for us trying to understand human mating competition. And it, it's, you know, it's really paid off um, as a trait, like, eminently quantifiable. You know, it's, it's unlike face, faces, which are hard to measure. You know, it's really easy to, to measure. There's a huge sex difference of about five standard deviations or more um, in voice pitch that occurs at, at puberty when, when mating competition becomes more intense. And, um, and uh, you know, it seems to be related to mate preferences and, and dominance competition including how we modulate it so um yeah anyway all right david let's bring this one home what are you working on next what's is there anything cool that you've got that you are doing right now uh yeah we're well we're working on some studies that we didn't really get too much into those topics but um looking at sort of how sex hormones um influence our our psychology and behavior so we have one study where we're looking at um people who have a condition where um, they had low sex hormones. Males and females both have this condition um, called IHH, where they had low sex hormone levels from the second trimester of gestation all the way to puberty when they get on hormone replacement therapy. And so we can look at how um, having low sex hormones, low estrogens and progestogens if you're female or low androgens like testosterone if you're male, how that influences psychology and behavior. Um, we're doing another study looking at um, women's phenotypes, their psychology, behavior, and other, and voice over the ovulatory cycle with changes in sex hormones. Um, and then we've got a couple of papers looking at uh, voice, a cross-cultural voice study, looking at um, how voice pitch influences perceptions of attractiveness and dominance across societies and what sociocultural variables modulate those influences. And another study that's a cross-species um, comparison looking at um, when you see the evolution of big sex differences in voice pitch across primates and how it seems to be related to um, male male competition, group size, things like that. Uh, a bunch of other things, but those are some of the, I think, most exciting ones that we're doing right now. That's cool. What, where should people go if they want to keep up to date with those studies and the stuff that you're working on? Um, well, if, if it's published studies, Google Scholar is always a great place to go. Um, you can just search for you know an author's um, Google Scholar account, and you'll see everything that's published recently. Um, some studies we might talk about on my lab um, website at Penn State, uh, but most of the time we we don't really say much about a study until we're we published it. So, yeah. All right, David, I appreciate you. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Good talking to you. What's happening, people? Thank you very much for tuning in. If you enjoyed that episode, then press here for a selection of the best clips from the podcast over the last few weeks, and don't forget to subscribe. Peace.